All right, let's talk about first the Kamala Harris's uh, debate. During that debate back in June, she kind of went at him for the busing stance. So I wanted to get from you what you thought of that moment uh, and, you, and the way that, uh, that, that Joe Biden reacted to it. What was your assessment of that? Well, understanding that I am somebody who's actually debated on a stage for uh, lieutenant governor, I've, I've run for public office, run for statewide office in South Carolina, um, I, I know the sport of politics. And uh, watching Kamala Harris debate uh, Joe Biden and everyone else that night, she was more than formidable. I mean, she won that debate. And she was head and shoulders better than any debater on the stage. I think that if anyone uh, looks back at the Democratic field and asks themselves who is the best debater that we have, you understand that to be Kamala Harris. So that moment um, was powerful because he didn't seem to have a response, that, that it's an issue that's important one to understand. Explain his reaction and, and why it's a, it's a relevant question for Joe Biden. Well, I mean, it's the Mike Tyson age old saying what happens when you everybody has a plan until you get punched in the jaw. Right. And so uh, he got punched in the jaw that night. Um, I thought it was it was fair game. I didn't think it was disrespectful or rude. Um, I thought it was the sport of politic. And not only that, but, you know, Joe Biden's record is one that's extremely long. Joe, Joe Biden's record is one that's extensive. Um, it's one that, you know, it, you have to um, sometimes unfairly. Um, Judge Joe Biden through the lens of 2020. Uh, you know, for, for many of us in South Carolina, we understand the relationships with individuals like Strom Thurmond, et cetera. For the nation in 2020, that's something that's really frowned upon and, and looked upon uh, through, a, through a lens that, that may not be fair for the era that they grew up in. The same with busing. And, and one of the things that I, that I must say is even my good friend David Axelrod, I think, Many people were unfair in their criticism of, of Kamala Harris for um, going after Joe Biden during that moment about busing during that time frame. Joe Biden was on the wrong side of history at that time. Um, regardless of what Kamala Harris thinks about busing today, um, Joe Biden was on the wrong side of history at that moment. And <laughs> black folk are sophisticated and we can be critical of Joe Biden and still work like hell to get him elected. And I don't see anything wrong with, with, those, uh, with those propositions. So from 75 to 82, he promoted dozens of bills that limited the feds from mandating busing. So just finish that thought off that you just said. Um, how do we, with 2020 eyes, how do we evaluate that at this point? I mean, with 2020 eyes, you have to be fair. And, and the only thing, and I think Joe Biden's major issue uh, with the, um, th this new heightened uh, scrutiny over elected officials being authentic. You know, I, I, you're not going to find anybody who hates Donald Trump more than me. Um, but Donald Trump has ushered in one new refreshing characteristic, although it's a complete fraud um, when he perpetrates it, but it's being authentic. And I would appreciate Joe Biden actually acknowledging his faults for um, being on the wrong side of history for many of those episodes, many of the things uh, many of the bills that he passed, many of the stances that he pushed for, acknowledging he was wrong and looking back, um, advocating and telling us how he um, would do better today, how he, through legislation and policy, would help unravel many of the wrongs that he was a part of. I think there's nothing wrong with maturation and growth, but it's something about 70-year-old white men and getting them to change and acknowledge faults and failures. Uh, so we'll have to see if that ever happens. So he boasted that, that he was, his, his name was on every major crime bill, you know, for, from 76 to 94. How should that be viewed at this point? So, uh, you know, I, for me, I actually started in 1982 with his civil asset forfeiture bill that he worked on with Strom Thurmond Jr. You go through 82, 84, I believe, and then you get to the 94 crime bill, etc. What you see is that um, Joe Biden through not his fault alone, because when you look at the totality and the context through which these bills were passed, you realize that the NAACP uh, and some other um, civil rights organizations were on the side of this. You realize that uh, the CBC, some um, black pastors, etc., cetera, on, on his side of, of this piece of legislation. But even with that, or these pieces of legislation, even with that, again, you come down on the fact that Joe Biden and the CBC were wrong. I 
even criticized Jim Clyburn with no hesitation. Um, the 94 crime bill was a bad bill. There's, no, there's nothing good that comes from taking uh, a generation of black men away from their family. There's nothing good that comes from that. And even um, when you draw up legislation and take it from someone who's a formerly elected official, when you, when you draw up legislation, even with some of the best intent, um, you can still have really, really bad consequences. And for no one to acknowledge those consequences is a failure um, on the part of them all. And the 94 bill and also the, the 84 and the 86 bills created the situation of mass incarcerations, created havoc in, in black communities. Why did they misunderstand the consequences or when did they figure out what the consequences were and, um, and how should that be viewed? I think they figured out the consequences about a generation later, which was a generation too late. Um, you know, you had penalties in this bill which treated um, crack versus cocaine uh, in grossly disproportionate fashion. And you know, white boys using coke uh, on, in the Hamptons get fines. Um, black guys selling crack for even lesser amounts without a criminal record get put away for the majority of their life. Um, th there's really no excuse for the failure in the implementation of this bill. There's no excuse for this bill. And the way that it should be treated is, it should be treated as a failure. And whenever you have failures in your political career or your life, you have to do everything you can to rectify and reconcile those things. Um, there has been no level of atonement from Joe Biden. There's been no level of atonement from the Congressional Black Caucus and those people who voted for that bill. Um, so what we're doing um, in this 2020 election is having faith and faith is such a funny, uh, a funny word um, to have faith in a, another man uh, that he will remedy those wrongs even without having the necessary atonement for those wrongs. We talked to uh, Congressman Clyburn and he, he supported uh, the 94 bill. He said, I voted for it too. You got to understand that uh, the Republicans came in and they took a lot of the good stuff out. Uh, and that yes, yes, there were indeed uh, unintended consequences, but that was because of the fact that there was a real problem with crime back then and they were looking for anything that would, would help. What's the response to that defense? No, Jim Clyburn's wrong too. Like, look, I can't be out here calling out Republicans for their malfeasance and their intellectual dishonesty and their short-sighted vision and refuse to call out uh, Democrats like Jim or, or, or the Vice President of the United States who I'm voting for to be President of the United States. What, what they did was, was uh, it, it, was, it was just, um, the 94 crime bill is one of the worst pieces of legislation in the history of the United States of America. And when you talk about a country that has a history as ours with racial violence perpetrated through statutory lenses, and I can still say that and be very firm in that, in that statement, then there needs to be some acknowledgement thereof. I think that the, the, the problem that many of us have is not that they passed the 94 crime bill, is that, there, is that there is a failure amongst um, gentlemen of a certain age, I dare not call them old, to acknowledge their failures. Do you think Joe Biden has evolved on these issues? Um, I think we're at the point now where I don't care if Joe Biden's evolved on these issues. And that's the tragedy of where we are in this country. Uh, I would appreciate the evolution of Joe Biden. I would appreciate the evolution of Jim Clyburn, somebody who is a resident of his district. But at this point, I, I really don't care about their evolution because this vote is a vote for literally the, our lives. Our lives depend on this vote in November. And so um, I will allow um, somebody or a power higher than I um, to adjudicate his evolution. But by saying that, do you think that um, he will take bold uh, criminal justice actions to um, reverse the, the problem of systemic race, racism? I don't think anyone can really look at Joe Biden and say that Joe Biden alone or the current leadership we have alone will um, eradicate systemic racism. And let me be extremely clear why, why I say that. Uh, Democrats and Republicans alike um, both have this really um, poor theory, political theory that rising tides lift all boats. Um, and Joe Biden's black agenda, uh, Jim Clyburn's black agenda, we keep going back to Jim, but this is kind of his, 
you know, they, they're coupled together now. Um, the failure in which stems from uh, a very stale way in which you look at the political process. Uh, as long as Joe Biden believes that rising tides lift all boats, um, as long as Joe Biden continues to put forth race-neutral policies to effectuate race-specific problems, nothing will ever change. Um, you cannot have race-neutral policy uh, when we have race-specific problems in this country. Uh, and Joe Biden doesn't seem to necessarily understand that, which is fine, uh, because he's light years better than the alternative. And the answer is what? If you had his ear, and you, you do have his ear, you're on the DNC advisory board for some of these issues when it comes to police and such. What is your advice to Joe Biden? If Joe Biden were here today, I would say, uh, you know, Mr. Vice President, that you, you have to have race-specific uh, solutions to these problems, period. Uh, th there's, no, there's no such thing as a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, the damage that was done through the 94 crime bill means that you have to direct resources to, to these communities, um, these black and brown communities that were negatively affected by what you thought was a good piece of legislation then. I would also advise the vice president to, it's very, very difficult for us to get to a position of forgiveness without any atonement. And the biggest problem that we have in this country is that we have an empathy deficit, but even more importantly, um, black folk always have to forgive. And there are a lot of black people in this country, a lot of young black people who are not in a position or a willingness to forgive Joe Biden. Um, and he has to be willing before he thinks or anyone around him thinks that because he's running against Donald Trump, that forgiveness will rain down um, like manna from heaven. He actually has to apologize and acknowledge his failures. But I mean, the black vote is like, tremendously important to Biden and to the Democratic Party. And, you know, you look at the primaries and he was he was in a bad position in there in the early primaries. But South Carolina turned it around. The black vote in South Carolina was essential to his success. Why is it that do you think that the, that if you're black in America, can you trust Joe Biden to, to do the necessary steps that we certainly are dealing with? And some white population is understanding a little bit better because the debate is happening on the streets of America. Is he is he? Is it possible for Joe Biden to accomplish some of the things that is called for, especially because of that support of the black population in America? So I think the question is wrong, uh, with all due respect. I, I, don't think that, I don't think that black folk in this country are voting for Joe Biden to be a panacea. Um, we're not voting for him to come in and be an Avenger um, or a superhero. What we are voting for him to do is root out the racism we have in the White House, period. Joe Biden has a, has a four-year goal, which is to stop cancer from spreading through this United States of America, the cancer known as, as racism and white supremacy as it emanates from 1600 Pennsylvania. Uh, that's it. Um, you know, reversing that, uh, uh, creating new programs, being bold and visionary, all of those things are gravy. Uh, but, you know, my father, my mother, um, the, the people of a generation who fought for all the progress, which is why I'm able to sit here today before this camera, they're, they're not voting for Joe Biden to be a change agent. I don't think anybody's doing that. We're, we're, we are voting for Joe Biden to stop the bleeding. What happened to your dad, the arrest, be, being shot in that demonstration? What does it say? What did what, what you learn from that experience, from your own family's experience about these issues? You know, I think I'm in a unique position because I'm truly a child of the movement and I value the progress we've made in this country. I um, was birthed understanding injustice. When your father goes to prison um, for rioting and he's the first and only one man riot in the history of this country, when your father is shot, when your sister's born without her father being there because he's in prison, it informs your beliefs. But even more importantly, I remember how, or learned how my father pushed uh, LBJ to be that much better. I remember how Stokely Carmichael talked about black power, but not the black power that evokes 
uh, fear amongst white people, but the black power that talks about self-sufficiency, that talks about economic power, that talks about political power, being able to take care of your, your own community, a lot like Black Lives Matter. And so when I look at my father, the biggest tragedy and heartache I have is that um, he's 75 and I'm 35. Um, and with the likes of even many of the same Democratic elected officials, we still have many of the same problems. How do you judge Biden? One of the major things we're looking at is how each of them deals with crises, because we're certainly in, in several large crises at the moment, and we, God knows what happens next. How do you judge him as the, his ability to lead this country in the uh, never-ending crises that we seem to uh, so, sort of be dealing with? So politics is, is uh, sport. And uh, I can only judge Biden against his opponent. Um, I don't have to judge Biden throughout the annals of history. Uh, I'm not judging Biden against JFK or Barack Obama. I'm judging Joe Biden against Donald Trump. Um, and black folk have two um, pandemics that they're living through. One is state sanctioned violence that we see at the hands of law enforcement. Uh, the other is um, uh, this coronavirus that's killing black folk at disproportionate rates. Um, if the question is, will he handle those two pandemics and issues better than Donald Trump? The answer is hell yeah. And the name of this film is The Choice 2020. So how, what type of choice is Joe Biden for uh, taking on this uh, leadership role? I don't, for me, it's not a choice. I mean, this is, this, is, this election is the antithesis to what I tell people politics is. Because I, I'm always somebody who tells you that you cannot just run uh, and tell people how bad your opponent is. That's never good politics. This is, this is the one example that, proves that, that disproves that theory. This is the antithesis. And so, um, I, like, they... I'm working extremely hard focusing on one group of people to get Joe Biden over the hump. I'm focused between um, now and November on black men to make sure they understand the importance, to make sure that they come out, to make sure that somebody's talking to them, to make sure somebody's listening to them and to soothe their fears or their concerns or their misconceptions uh, about Joe Biden or, or the democratic process. Because at the end of the day, I think most people will come down along the same lines in this choice 2020 is that my children don't deserve to grow up in a country where Donald Trump is president of the United States. The film is called The Choice 2020. The choice is between these two guys. That's all that's on, you know. That's a, that's I, I actually don't agree with that. So I, I think, <laughs> so, my, <laughs> so let, I don't mean to disrupt the thesis or the theory of the film. However, uh, in 2016, what we saw was that uh, we thought there was a choice between uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and a lot of people chose the couch. Um, there were four million people who voted for Barack Obama in 2012 who did not show up in 2016. Some of that had to do with voter suppression. The rest of that had to do with the fact that we had two of the most unpopular candidates in the history of this country. And so this choice isn't just between Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton, I mean, or Joe Biden and Donald Trump, excuse me. Uh, this choice is between Joe Biden, Donald Trump, and the couch. And Joe Biden has to do everything he can do to make sure that people come out and vote for him. And he has to give them a reason to do so. Um, I think that, and I'm, I'm unashamed and unabashed um, in saying that uh, Joe Biden is running against George Wallace 2.0, somebody who embodies white supremacy, somebody who is a racist, um, somebody who allows individuals like in Charlottesville to chant Jews shall not replace us to say nigger out loud without wearing hoods or mask. Um, they find that comfort in Donald Trump. And so um, for me very personally, I think that Joe Biden is running against what America was. Uh, so Joe Biden is 77 years old. And you know, he's my choice, um, he's my horse, and I have to believe in a 77 year old white man to take us to the promised land, to beat back white supremacy, uh, to beat back racism. Um, but he's my hope and he's my faith. Uh, that's a lot of pressure. 
Um, but at the end of the day, November 3rd, I, I hope we're successful. One last thing that we didn't cover, but you commented on a little bit, was that when he came to the Senate, he worked with white uh, segregationists. You talked a little bit about understanding that, and he gets some grief about that as well. I mean, he worked on the crime bills. He worked on the anti-busing bills, you know, with that, that group of white Southern senators. How, does, how do we view that at this point? So there are a couple of things. I look at it, I think that politics is more nuanced than people want to make it on Twitter. And it's very hard to adjudicate or judge Joe Biden's record on Twitter, which we try to do. Working with Southern segregationists during that time um, is appropriate because there were a lot of them there. And in, or and in order to pass any legislation, you had to do so. I worked with people in the state house who did not want to take the Confederate flag down. I call them my friends today. Like these are individuals I had to work with who were on the wrong side of history. I acknowledge that. I believe that they acknowledge that now, but that was still the political process. I think that we've gotten to this place where we can't talk across party lines. I think we got into this place and this is the benefit. And this is the, this is one of the blessings of Joe Biden. He comes from an age where it was okay to talk to people who didn't look like you, who didn't believe the same things, who um, may, may have been ardent segregationists, but you wanted to get to know them. You wanted to work with them because you had things to do. You had legislation to pass for what you thought was the benefit of the country. Um, with that being said, while I understand the relationships, I'm still very critical of the legislation that emerged from those relationships, um, especially when we talk about busing or we talk about um, the, the crime bills. But I'm pretty certain that they're probably, you know, decent pieces of legislation that emerge as well from those relationships. And so um, I'm not someone who, who's overly critical of him giving a eulogy at Strom Thurmond's funeral. Because what black folk will tell you in South Carolina is that there was no person better on constituent services than Strom Thurmond. Whenever there was an issue that was had, people went to Strom Thurmond. Um, and so I... I I don't know. I, I'm pretty weird about this because I'm friends with Tim Scott. I'm friends with Nikki Haley. I'm friends with Trey Gowdy. I served with all these people. I'm friends with Mick Mulvaney. And so that doesn't bode well for me on Twitter, but it's real life. And I don't I don't really care about the criticism one receives. And I don't hold that against Joe Biden either. Lastly, and, and then I'll ask you what we've missed. His, his civil rights record. I mean, some people will say he didn't do enough. Some people will say he has a pretty good civil rights record. I mean, this is this is one of the major issues for this campaign. How do you rate sort of looking back at his his involvement and his his success or failure? Rated against whom? Like over the annals of time or against Trump? What's the question? Rated against what we expect in a, a politician in 2020. Oh, in 2020? Uh, so, so Joe Biden's civil rights record is one that's nuanced. It can't just be, um, I don't think, looked at through the lens of today. I think Joe Biden's civil rights record as vice president is glowing. And Joe Biden has the Obama halo. Everybody knows that. I mean, that, that, is, that is the cleansing of Joe Biden and everything that may have happened that was, um, um, you know, staunchly conservative under democratic auspices for, you know, 40 years. So the question is, how, how do you adjudicate his last eight years um, as VP? Amazing. Um, he was there with Barack Obama. He balanced Barack Obama. He was, in, he was one of the best vice presidents this country's ever seen. Um, how do I adjudicate his, his senatorial record? Um, you know, as a United States senator, Joe Biden was a C, probably on a good day. Um, and so, I mean, you have to balance that out. But I do give people credit for where they end up in life. And I think that um, Joe Biden as vice president, the Joe Biden that many black people are voting for. See, and that's what people don't understand. People aren't voting for the Joe Biden who voted for the 94 crime bill that was the architect of uh, Anita Hill's destruction. They're voting for Joe Biden who was uh, Barack Obama's vice president. And, and for many people, these are two different people. <laughs> and so uh, you have to give him some credit for the progress that he was made, that was made um, and there's such a great irony that someone who was the architect of the 94 crime bill and a white man of this age, and when you think about Anita Hill, his crutch, his, the reason for his success, 
is a black man with a funny name who's kind of skinny from Hawaii by way of Kansas. I don't know. I, think, I just think that history has a very interesting way uh, of, of showing itself forward. And because you mentioned it, let's talk for one second about Anita Hill. The Thomas hearings, what's your overview about that performance? So you don't want to know, I, I tell people, do you want to know what is America? America is replacing Thurgood Marshall with another black man just because he's black by the name of Clarence Thomas. Uh, and for the person who we're counting on to, rooting out, to root out racism to be a part of, of that hearing and spectacle, um, Anita Hill is extremely strong. Anita Hill deserves respect. Anita Hill deserves an apology. Um, uh, Joe Biden was wrong on that. And uh, I believe he acknowledges that. Um, and he must acknowledge that. Uh, because, you know, as a black woman, they usually, not usually, they, they oftentimes, more than often, they, they, they're forced or compelled to bring up the back of this bus, especially in the Democratic Party. They just get thanked. And so that's why um, anything less than a black female vice president from Joe Biden is, um, is a failure.